Thank you so much, and so lovely to be here this afternoon, and nice to see you all here. So in this very fast paper, we are going to tell, about, tell to you about an ongoing um, a DH project that aggregates epistolary metadata from a wide variety of Finnish cultural heritage organizations. So this is actually the slide I wanted to show you. So it, this is the outline of today's presentation. So we, I will very quickly tell you about our project. And, um, and then Senka will explain some of the difficulties we have with the data and then we will return to this uh, why to collaborate question because this is the theme of the whole conference, collaboration between researchers and interna uh, international collaborations and so on. Um, our starting point is that letters, of course, and their contents are a central resource for historians, so they are used all the time. But letters could also be approached from a numerical, from, um, from a quantitative, quantitative perspective, but if if the problem of uh, numerical information was solved. Namely, uh, we don't know how many, how many letters there are in the collections of Finnish cultural heritage organizations, and these organizations don't know it even themselves. So this is where our project starts. There are, of course, other epistolary projects running in Europe. We actually heard about this German project, Project Corres Search yesterday in a session, and many of these other uh, European projects, they actually aggregate well, very well curated data, often from edited letter collections. Our starting point is quite different. So when we uh, sketched the project proposal, our vision was to uh, aggregate the re registered metadata of all letters, public and private, kept in the collections of archives, libraries and museums relating to the period of the Grand Duchy of Finland. So today we have almost 70,000 actors in our, in our data set and the metadata units run to over 700,000 uh, letters. So this is a very inclusive archive aggregated across the silos of these cultural heritage organizations. This means that we don't have any scholarly filters. So scholars have not decided beforehand who are important canonical persons, but naturally, these archives, libraries, museums, they have their own collection policies, so there are naturally some filters. So our data set is quite exceptional, but there are also quite exceptional data-related challenges. But before we get to data, there was this first challenge that we had to solve before we even start to work. So we realized quite soon that uh, we, it's quite difficult to get a commensur commensurable information from the, of the collections of these, uh, our data providers. So our solution was to make this kind of webpropel metadata, metadata survey that we sent to over 100 Finnish uh, cultural heritage organizations and received actually over 50 answers, which we, consi answers which we consider as a quite good result. And uh, the core information we received from this survey is that uh, over 60% have catalogued more than 50% of their letter collections, but this data is often not directly in a machine-readable format. But if we also accept Word documents, then we get to more than 60% that we can actually use. So this is a very important information for us, but this is also something that we need to provide to the end users of our data sets so they understand the representativity of the data. And now I hand over to Senka. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk more about this technical part. So what do we do with the data when we get it? And as Ilona said, we get data from different institutions in various formats. So the first step we need to do is to har harmonize it. And uh, we, to do this, we put it into intermediary RDF format. Then after that, we have developed COCO data model, our own data model that we use to transfer the data to linked open data. And from there, we can further enrich data, uh, do disambiguation and linking with outside sources. Like here we have some, like Wikidata is the most famous one, but also we have a biography sample, academy sample, which are mostly with Finnish uh, people. And we also have ontology of place names and, and occupation ontology. And then after that, for future work, we are going to do the deduplication of uh, actors and places 
And finally, we are going to get harmonized correspondence metadata. So this harmonization process is uh, quite challenging for us because we get data in different source formats and uh, the data is not always nicely structured. So to get the relevant information first, we have to parse files and we have to create parser for every file separately. What is really important is that we need to understand data sets and what we da which data it has and its own challenges. And sometimes we also have to do NLP to get the data out of it. So I'm going to show you a few problems that we are having and with parsing, for instance, here is a CSV file, which should be nice to parse, but unfortunately uh, it contains data like here uh, in unstructured format, which we have to then parse separately. And also sometimes uh, files can be corrupt. So for, uh, for example, here, uh, some cells have been shifted in the wrong place. So we have to identify those things and, uh, and do something about it to fix it. Then the most challenging uh, documents that we have are Word files, which are uh, somewhat structured. So in the beginning, they ha usually have biography of actor. And then there is some kind of letter, letter exchange catalog. Like here, we have received letters where we have names of senders, then time, amount of letters, and signum. So this is an easy example. But usually, catalogs also contain uh, more difficult and, well, not very difficult, but they're not all in the same format, so we have to take this into account. For example, here we have correspondence between different people, so not just uh, sender, for example. Uh, but this can be written in this format as well, like one line after another, and also like in columns like this, or something like this with a slash. So parsing is difficult, but we are managing that. And then understanding data sets is, it's, it, we, we have realized it's really important as every data set is unique with the unique challenges. So we have been having uh, meetings together with uh, computer scientists and historians in order to see what, what is important information that we need to get, what information can be left out that we are not interested in. And according to that, we have to regularly update our data model. And uh, for NLP, in this case, I will just show you like uh, one example that is quite often occurring. Uh, so where we have a uh, recipient in genitive case, and then we have to get nominative case. It's quite uh, straightforward, but for Finnish, it's uh, not easy task, especially uh, with unknown words or foreign names. So we have to use a smart way to approach this. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Senka. And now we are moving on. So the, what is the impact? So why should the cultural heritage organizations collaborate with, this, with us? And these insights come uh, especially from the National Gallery of Finland, but also from other cultural heritage organizations. So they get better understanding of their data. We actually return to these organizations and tell them how, do, how does their data look and what we have done with that. And sometimes they perhaps can receive some uh, more structured data from us if they want that. And they get information about their collections, how much uh, 19th century epistolary material there is, how much is accessible, has been cataloged, and what kind of biases they have in their data sets. I will return to these shortly at the end. And they, uh, I have heard they gain motivation for additional cataloging, uh, which might end up as improved customer service. They have been writing new cataloging guidelines, and perhaps they even get new cataloging priorities, for example, prior prioritizing women's archives that not have been organized before. And we will also provide them with an alternative user interface that they can uh, provide their customers or ask their customers to start with when they start to browse their archives. So this is our in-project in user interface that we are using ourselves at the moment and, and will be developing further and probably opening uh, in the beginning of next year for, uh, for, uh, for te some test users. And uh, now we move to the additional understanding of the of their data sets, uh, specific data sets and data sets as, as a whole. So as Senka mentioned, this is a linked open data source uh, project. And you can see here that of our where is that? Of our almost 70,000 actors, only 13% actually links to outside sources. So that means that kind of 13% are so important that they have, for example, an entry in the national biography. 
And of course, then we have in those Word documents this kind of sm sm small biography in the beginning. So we are sort of considering if we could somehow use that information to get more people linked in. But this is, this is actually an interesting outcome. Then we get this kind of results if we use slightly more advanced methods for some humanist more advanced methods like Sparkle queries, receiving count, sending count per year. And then um, a better understanding of the data collections, the gender bias of, bias of this, of this uh, 19th century uh, letter collection is actually something that we keep on returning to and seems to be, it's very interesting, we think, to see that um, that how, how much uh, gender information do we have there, and what is then the gender bias, bias in, in different collections. And I know you, can, you can't probably see the collection names here, or the arch archival names here, but you can, you can somehow see the general trend. And I was actually surprised that there are many archives where the gender, bias, bias, uh, gender balance is surprisingly even, like here with the Finnish Literature Society. But on the other hand, uh, this is the National Archives, so that's much more male-oriented. And then we can provide different kind of visualizations as to uh, what kind of we, for example, can, can, can get some occupational information when we link to national biography uh, for some of, the, some of the actors in our data sets. So basically what we are as uh, historians, as a humanist now, very interested in the project is the, is the is the combination of digital humanities and archival history or perhaps critical, critical histories of collections or whatever we phrase it. So what are the data profiles? What kind of gaps there are? Thank you.